I'm from the University of Kent and I'm lucky enough to be doing a PhD on psychedelic support slash harm reduction, um, which meant that um, my field work last summer took me to six different transformational festivals in the UK, the US and in Portugal. Um, now normally when I'm doing an academic presentation I've got to explain this for 10 minutes and it's a massive relief not to have to. But um, for those of you who aren't aware of the category of transformational festivals, they have these kind of features in common. Certain types of music, visionary art, um, rituals, they tend to be more about participation than spectation. And uh, there's kind of an underlying remit of change of the self and the world. And so these were kind of the the crucible for psychedelic support to start happening because the psychedelic experience is really central to their whole ethos. Um, so these are the psychedelic support care spaces that I worked in at each of these festivals. Uh, Cosmicare there in the middle, Cosmicare UK. Um, there's a lovely picture of the altar with a picture by a picture painted by Karen here. Um, <laughs> And we've also got the Zendo um, at Burning Man and the Portuguese facility which this was their office and this was the um, drug checking facility that they worked really closely with which had thin film chromatography which is kind of the bee's knees and is just one way in which Portugal is very different from anywhere else. Um, so. What happens in these places is they're sanctuary spaces for anyone who's having a difficult time with psychedelics or some other drug at a festival. And you are assigned a sitter when you arrive whose job is not to talk you down, it's to make you comfortable and create a space of safety so that you can confront your stuff and go through your process, whatever that might be. Um, so my summer of sitting brought me all kinds of interesting cases. Um, from people who were actually in some kind of medical or psychological trouble, like people who'd been dosed with the wrong thing or sold the wrong thing, um, overdoses, like there was a girl who'd overdosed on GHB, um, and a lot of people who were just really, really pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but that ran the gamut right through to lots of classic psychedelic crises of the sort that you read about in psychedelic books, LSD, ego death. Um, world implodes, need to reassemble themselves. And this is a bit of my field notes from sitting with a lovely girl who had completely lost her ego on the dance floor at Boom and was slowly rebuilding it over the course of several hours. It's kind of a wall of text, but the key thing I think is as she came out of it, she was wondering how she could ever go back to being just one person because she had felt like she was everything and we were sort of helping her reassemble herself but also keep hold of what had happened to her. So, um, yeah, this is hard work for sitters obviously but it's kind of the visitors who are doing the real metaphysical heavy lifting and we just sort of facilitate that happening and it's amazing. Um, and we call this thing we do harm reduction which I think is really interesting. Um, as if it was just damage control. And this is massive, so I'm <coughs> going to explain it slowly. Um, so what we do really does reduce harm, um, very, very much so. Like having psychedelic support takes a massive burden off the medics who are set up to process loads of cases really fast, like sprained ankle, through you go, um, scraped knee, there you go, not look after someone for six hours. So we take care of the people who are just in need of a quiet place to sit for a few hours until they feel better and so on. Um, and sometimes there are like really dangerous situations that get averted, like one girl at the Zendo told a support worker that she'd been considering driving her car into the man while he was burning earlier that night and now she changed her mind and she wasn't going to do that. Um, <laughs> But if you could see the people having breakthroughs, you would start to feel a bit funny about the focus on harm. Um, 
So where did this idea of harm reduction come from? Um, I've drawn this chart to try and sort of explain where the movement came from and how it sort of got um, not entangled, that sounds negative, but how it got involved with psycho psychedelic support. Um, harm reduction is an approach to caring for drug users which started in the Netherlands in the late 70s and early 80s, around the time that HIV was starting to happen. And it was a peer support movement by heroin addicts who were advocating for each other. Um, you've got this thing called the Junkie Bond or the Junkies Union. And there's also links with sex worker activists who were also being hit really hard by HIV and wanted to do their own harm reduction. Hence things like this. Um, so that's the kind of thing that they're trying to do. Um, so in the beginning it was all about peers, like users advocating for and supporting each other, much like happens in um, some bits of the psychedelic support world. Um, but subsequently it kind of split off as it spread into different countries. Like the UK developed a version which was much more medical and much more about the doctor-patient relationship. And then that carried on into new labour, where harm reduction was part of politics, but the definition of harm started to change. And it went from harm to drug users to harm to communities caused by drug users through crime. And that was the harm that they were trying to stop. And then the coalition chucked it out altogether and went back to abstinence. Um, so then you have the USA, which sort of briefly considered it for about two years, and then neoconservatism came in and the Rave Act of 2003 pretty much criminalised harm reduction at events because if you were an event organiser and you provided harm reduction facilities it meant that you knew there were drugs at your event and so you were liable and you could have the majesty of the law come down upon you. So harm reduction is still dangerously radical in America in a lot of ways and is largely, being, is, is largely still a peer movement. Um, Portugal, mind you, is a totally different story in that they've completely embraced harm reduction at government level as part of their de decriminalisation policy. Just a quick time check. Hmm. Um, so they have foregrounded harm reduction in their whole approach to drugs. Um, and one sort of thing that comes along with that is that if you're working in harm reduction in Portugal, you sort of have to operate within the medicalisation model, perhaps more than, than other places. But that's kind of a subtle point because on the whole, they're kind of the world leaders in the whole thing. Um, and let me see. So that's where things are today and there are fantastic things happening in Portugal. And the fact that it's prohibited in the US is kind of disgraceful. But there are a few problems with working entirely within that approach as how you consider drug use, especially when the drugs are psychedelics. So I reckon there are kind of, there are four problems with the way that we think about harm and drugs. Um, it ignores benefits, like there's a lot of research happening about the benefits of ayahuasca, for example. Um, you have the downright sinister things like in the UK, harm being defined as harm done by users rather than to users. Um, and then you've got a focus on the individual very strongly, who is considered in isolation and makes free choices to use drugs, and you ignore all the social factors that might be an influence. And especially you're ignoring large-scale social systems like drug policy, which actually cause a lot of harm themselves. And in fact, this is a quote from an academic called Tim Rhodes, who describes um, governments and other institutions as agents of harm production, which I think is a nice way to put it. Um, la 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 la. Yeah. Okay, so today I'm going to focus on ways in which drug policy actually makes it easier or more difficult for psychedelic support to operate at events in the places where I did field work. And yeah, after all the faff with the video, I think I may not have enough time to show both the videos. Uh, how am I doing? For like about 10 minutes? Right. Yeah, um, this is a talk by um, João Gulau, the Portuguese minister at Boom, and he was 
sitting on a panel with members of Cosmicare and told us all that he thought most people used, joy, used drugs to potentiate joy and happiness. He was delighted that the Portuguese government had provided these support services that we could all um, resort to if we needed to. And he said, some of you, some of us are using substances and so on and got a lot of spontaneous rounds of applause. Um, so by contrast, I had this other sound clip, which is also two minutes long and my minutes are slightly precious, but um, it is a piece of audio that I recorded on the Esplanade at Burning Man, which is the main street, the central street. Um, it was a show on the community radio by a representative of Lawyers for Burners, um, explaining in great detail that we should always be polite to law enforcement, but here is, is exactly what will happen if they pull you over and going through the stages of how you have a right to not consent to be searched. He, was, he stressed that a lot, you don't have to consent to a search. But what happens if you don't consent is they bring out a dog and you get searched anyway. And that's what's going to happen. And there is a kind of ambient atmosphere at Burning Man of fear of law enforcement and everybody tells each other to be careful and not to talk to people um, that they don't know about drugs at all. So, two very different atmospheres. Um, so with that in mind, there are kind of two main ways that punitive drug policy makes life harder for psychedelic care spaces. And uh, the first one I'm going to look at is how visible they're able to be and how visible visitors can be to you, like how, how much they can trust you to, to reveal stuff to you. Um, and then there's the availability of a drug checking service, which is really useful and it's quite difficult to operate without one. Um, the visibility thing first. Um, here's the central plaza at Boom with a massive map. And if you can see the pale blue dot sort of halfway across um, in a really central position, that's the Cosmic Air compound. And it's on the survival guide and it's on all the materials. and. It's discussed at the Liminal Village space, and it's kind of, it's an institution. I mean, it's not a picnic. It took a long time for Cosmic Air to get to that position where the festival organizers are putting them um, in the foreground, but there aren't such big legal obstacles in their way. Whereas, quite different situation in the US. Um, the Burning Man organization, because of the Rave Act, have to pretend that the Zendo project doesn't exist or that they don't know anything about it. So, positioning depends entirely on who the Zendo can persuade to host them. So it changes year to year. And you can see that the 2013 position was on the main street and they had 180 visitors. And 2014, it was way out, that's, that's actually really far out, down a dark side street. And they had only 55 and it was really difficult to find. That was because the camp who hosted them in 2013 weren't there that year. So they're very much at the mercy of circumstance because the organisers can't help them at all. And then we have a UK festival um, named Redacted who didn't put, who, who um, at first didn't want psychedelic support to be at the event because we don't have drugged up people here is what they said. And then they got in trouble because there was a scandal at the local hospital with people who were having bad drug experiences being brought in and the cancer ward being upset by all the screaming. So they decided they had better have us, but they sort of tucked the Cosmic Air uh, compound way away out at the back and on the very far side from medical, so it was very difficult for, medi for medical to send anybody across. And I'm going to briefly go to this, I and mean, you guys all know how important set and setting is. We were tucked away behind this thing. <laughs> which ran all night and most of the day. So that was right in front of Cosmic Air. Um, and current slide. Yeah, right. I like seizures, don't you? Um, and then, as I said, there's the trust issue as well, um, because... It's not just whether you can show yourself to visitors freely or whether you're a sort of guilty secret, but it's also whether visitors feel like they can show what they're doing to you. And there's a 
huge undercover police presence at Burning Man and the wisdom that, that, that gets passed around as one of my informants said, if anyone speaks to you about drugs at all, plead complete ignorance. So when you're volunteering for the Zendo project, they send out roamers to talk to people in the dance camps and so on and see if anyone's having a crisis. And on the shifts that I was, that I was there for, I talked to the roamers and nobody, but nobody had admitted to having taken any drugs at all in all the night that they were walking around. And I had a guy who was clearly on acid, who was saying that his chi was modulating strangely um, and insisted he was just drunk all night. And I said, I asked him to tell me what he'd taken and he said, I don't think I should tell you that, it's irrelevant to my personal quest. Um, but that was fairly typical. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, presence of a drug checking service and I'm going to illustrate that through two contrasting case studies of two different novel psychoactive substances, one in Portugal with a checking service and one in the UK without one. Um, the first one, uh, the one, the one at Boom that's spinning gracefully there for you is DOX, which is a family of psychedelic amphetamines, um, DOI, DOM, DOET and so on. And they tend to get sold as LSD but they last for 25 to 35 hours. So it's a bit of a surprise when you're expecting 12. And uh, these cases started coming in on the first night at Cosmic Air at Boom and they just weren't coming down. So we were thinking, what the hell's going on here? And luckily we could just run up the road to check in who did their thin film chromatography and told us what it was. So um, immediately there were alerts posted up by check in around the site, don't buy the blue fractal blotters and similar things. And meanwhile, Cosmicare was able to formulate a strategy for what happens if you get one of these really long cases. Whereas at the, the Redacted English Festival, we had Alpha PVP, which is a new synthetic cathinone. Um, they don't know how it works. It might be a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, but nobody really knows. Um, it can cause binging and extreme paranoia. It gets sold as MDMA, but you only need a fifth as much for a dose. So people end up dosing themselves five times over and then binging. And at Cosmicare UK, we had a whole tribe of friends come in suffering from really intense paranoia where they thought that they'd been accused of stealing. They were going to be strip searched. Um, they were the only people at the festival who weren't involved in a massive conspiracy to harass them. And of course, this was really difficult for us because we needed to convince them that we weren't part of the conspiracy and any time we doubted anything they were saying, they got really offended and said that it proved that we were part of the conspiracy. So in the end, what we had to do was just almost sort of buy into the story to some extent in order to persuade them to try and sleep because we knew they wouldn't believe it when they woke up. And I was with them for quite a while, but there are heroes in this room who were with them for 18 hours nonstop. I salute you. Um, and it, it seems that they had stimulant psychosis because somebody on staff was able to figure out that uh, the stuff was probably a cathinone and that that's what happens when you binge a cathinone and you don't sleep. So that was our strategy. And as it happens, we were nearly right. We thought it was pentadrone, but it was a really close relative. But the plot thickens when we went over to welfare the next day and discovered that lots of other people had the, had the same kind of paranoia, like down to the details, accused of stealing, etc., etc. But the medical tent had been briefed that it was really strong MDMA and they wouldn't listen to me that it was something else and that it wasn't behaving like an overdose of MDMA. And I was told by one of the nurses that they'd had hundreds of cases like that and welfare had had loads as well. So all those people got treated um, who probably had stimulant psychosis as though they had serotonin syndrome. And those two conditions are not the same. And I don't know how many people ended up in the hospital, I'm trying to find out, but um, apparently the police were testing on site, I was told by an organiser later. But he claims that they didn't find anything dodgy, so they didn't put up the alert system that they had organised for that year. Um, so I think whatever the police were doing it was seriously lacking. So yeah, in the situation of having no checking, you have rampant harm caused by the fact that people can carry on selling this kind of crap completely unchecked and there's no way to find out what it is or what kind of damage it might do. 
um, even for the medical teams who are desperately in need of good information. So this is the end and you can't see my email address, brilliant, because I've made it the wrong colour. <laughs> but um, uh, I will... I can give you a beautiful flyer, but just a second. Um, just as a, as a final comment, when you're doing this kind of work, it's, it feels it's desperately important that there be a safety net, especially when the government has disowned people, like Theresa May has said, if people take drugs they should take the consequences. Um, so there needs to be a safety net, but sometimes it feels like we're just scurrying around cleaning up the messes made by um, the drug regimes and their methods of harm production. And in order to deal with this kind of thing, we need to be able to deal with systemic stuff alongside caring for individuals. Otherwise, I'm reminded of a quote by the late great Ian Banks who said that giving to charity under capitalism is like putting a band-aid on cancer. And there's kind of a similar thing going on here in that if we don't address the biggest 50 pound, 500 pound gorilla of harm, um, this sort of stuff is going to keep happening. So I'll close by saying I'm still researching, I'm doing a survey of people who have been to a harm reduction service and been looked after or who have just had a difficult experience at a festival but didn't get that kind of help. Um, in order to try and get the perspective of the visitors, which I don't really have yet, I've seen it from the inside. So if you want to help with the research, the survey web address is there, I've got flyers and contributions will make my day. Thank you very much and thanks for listening.